Great. So, so I'd like to thank the organizers for um, in, inviting me here. And uh, this is not uh, the usual audience I speak to. So if uh, I say something that's not at all clear because I just make some assumption about what you know, please stop me and, uh, and let me know where I went wrong. And um, I'd, I'd like to start by uh, thanking Dr. Heck Nielsen for suggesting this title, because this uh, uh, statement here, that there are problems and solutions, is something I'd like to take at the start just a couple minutes to say something about. And the first two speakers, Dr. Simon and Dr. Moda, went a long way toward helping me um, tell you what I mean by this. So um, obviously, there's, there's a problem. I mean, we can't um, make a computer model that can do the most fundamental things that even a mouse brain or maybe even a mosquito brain can do. Um, so, uh, but if we want to solve the problem, we have to lay blame. Okay, whose fault is it? Well, I'm here to tell you it's my fault. It's the fault of me and people like me. It's not the fault of the people making computers. The computers are probably powerful enough, uh, but uh, you could argue about that. Um, the the uh, people in this room are smart enough to, to figure out you know, uh, what to do with data and how to put it uh, into computers and make models like we, we just heard in Dr. Moda's talk. But the real fundamental problem is that our data are not what you need. Okay? So we've failed to create the right kind of data. So even though you could go to the Society for Neuroscience meeting in San Diego and see 30,000 people there uh, presenting posters and be just deluged with data, it's not the right data. It's not what you need. Okay? And, and in fact, um, Dr. Moda made some, some statements during his talk which really um, highlight this, this problem that we've got sort of culturally in neuroscience, this sort of need for optimism that we can make progress and move forward, but at the same time the need to be, to be realistic. And it's when we can offer solutions that we can start to realistically um, accept that there are problems. And so, so Dr. Moda um, talked about data from Benziger and Martin based on a lot of detailed anatomy. And he said, um, at the same time, he said that nobody has the precise tools today to figure out the graph. And I'm going to emphasize that in the first half of my talk. I'm going to tell you that circuitry is amazingly precise in the brain. So some methods that we developed 10 years ago or so and have used a lot, I'll show you that uh, those data tell us that the circuitry is too precise uh, to be able to use those kind of anatomical tools that Binziger and Martin used to be able to tell us really what the circuitry is at the, the level of resolution that we need. And in the second half of the talk, I'm going to tell you that we have hope that we've developed methods that will allow us um, to, to solve that problem. Okay? Um, and another thing that Dr. Moda said is, you know, after he said we have the connectivity graph, he also said the data is, does not have the space, spatial resolution needed. And that really is the fundamental problem. The methods that we've had available can't get us to the spatial resolution that's required to really understand the circuitry in the brain at the level that's required to make a realistic uh, model that incorporates those uh, details at which the brain really is, is functioning. Okay? Um, so this is my, my usual title slide. And this tells us the resolution that we're talking about. And we're going to talk about something I'm going to call fine scale specificity of cortical connections. And that will become clear as I show you the data. And also cell type specificity, that there are many different cell types in any little tiny piece of brain, like, like say, all these cells here, um, that um, they're uh, composed of many different types. And you can't take a, a a description anatomically of where axons are and where dendrites are and statistically say, um, well, I can just compute the probability of connections from that. Circuitry is more precise. The actual connectivity is more precise than you can, can predict from the anatomy. And there's cell type specificity and fine scale specificity. Okay? So um, it helps now to sort of step back and say, OK, um, you know, if we want to understand how neural circuits give rise to something, to perception, to say visual perception, to, to behavior, um, what are the things you have to know? And, and I think this is sort of inherently obvious, but it's, it's worth pointing out that, of course, if you want to know what a circuit is doing, you do have to have the blueprint. You have to know the circuit. Um, and, uh, and so in the start, I'm going to tell you that the circuit's precise and uh, that we don't know it yet. Okay? 
And this is mostly what I'm focusing on today. But in addition, even if the methods that I tell you about today tell us in excruciating detail exactly what neuron in the brain is, you had the exact wiring diagram, you still wouldn't know how it worked because there are all kinds of dynamic interactions and things changing on a millisecond time scale. And so we're going to have to relate this to function. So I'll try to point out today how some of the methods I'm going to talk about allow us to relate circuitry uh, to function. Of course, e even there, these are just correlations, and we need uh, models and theories, and hopefully these are testable within the context of the types of methods that we actually have available to use experimentally so that you can find out whether your model really is, is, is right or not. And maybe sometimes models will be generated that are five or ten years ahead of their time, but hopefully that we can catch up in uh, developing better methods. So I'm going to tell you a little bit today about one method that we've, we've developed that allow us to be able to, to test hypotheses by perturbing circuits at a higher level of resolution than uh, has been possible before. Okay. So if we think historically at you know, our understanding of, of cortical circuits in particular, but this is probably true of any kind of circuit in the brain, we've progressively gotten a better and better understanding um, as the methods have improved. So, for example, by 1991 or so, uh, Fellowman and Van Essen were able to create a circuit diagram of the visual system, which incorporated connections between different visual cortical areas, defined uh, dozens of cortical areas and, and which ones are connected to which. And we knew roughly what the different functions were of those different visual areas. But we know that embedded within any one of those visual areas is uh, local circuitry within the cortex and that it has a modular organization. There are layers and columns in the cortex and circuitry is precise at this level of organization. Particular neurons will send axons only to a particular compartment to a particular module. Um, and different cell types might be, might found, be found to make projections that depend on where they are in the module, in, in what module they're found. Now, it turns out that we've known since the time of call that in any one of these modules, there are dozens of different cell types. There are not just excitatory cells that make up 80% and inhibitory cells that make up 20%, but um, uh, any, uh, but there are dozens of different inhibitory cell types and dozens of different excitatory cell types. And, and I'm going to show you in the very first experimental data that I'm going to tell you about today that um, it turns out that when you have different cell types whose dendrites are intertwined within a structure, that you can't predict the connectivity just by saying, well, what are the cells that send axons into that structure? Um, it turns out that it's not just... Uh, by chance that they make connections to the cells, but those axons will selectively target some cell types and avoid other cell types. Okay? So we have to have a description of circuitry at that level of resolution. And uh, we, we have methods now that will allow us to get that description. Okay? And that's what I, I mean by uh, microcircuits. In the second half of the, the experimental data, I'll tell you that even two neurons next to each other of the same cell type are connected differently. And this is what I mean by fine scale specificity of, of connections. So in this first example, we're going to focus on inhibitory neurons in the cortex. And um, this is from, going to be from work that, that we did, uh, say, I think like seven years ago now. And um, there are, th this is a simplification here. There are probably uh, a dozen or so different distinct inhibitory cell types in the brain. This uh, picture from a review from uh, Yasuo Kawaguchi um, highlights a few of these inhibitory cell types and also just sort of lumps together all the excitatory neurons as one uh, general pyramidal cell type. And for the purposes of what I'm going to show you right now, we're just going to worry about two general classes of inhibitory cells. Uh, fast spiking inhibitory cells, which if we record from them intracellularly and inject current into them and look at how they uh, transform that current into spikes, we can reliably identify this unique cell type. Um, and, and we won't worry about it beyond that. Um, and then there are uh, many other inhibitory cell types which have different properties when you inject current into their cell body. And I'm just going to lump these all together into non-fast spiking, uh, non spiking cells. But keep in mind that this is you know, just a simplification for the convenience of making this point that connections are cell type specific. Okay. So now if we, we take all these neurons and put them in the context of uh, a schematic of cortex here where we have the peel 
uh, surface up here, the white matter down here. It's a layered structure, and we have ways anatomically of identifying these laminar boundaries. And we look at uh, some of these intracellular fills of neurons. You know, these happen to be from monkey primary visual cortex that we did, but the data from Binziger and Martin and the cat uh, would have essentially these same excitatory cell types. So all these are just a few selected uh, cell types with their dendrites in blue and axons in yellow. And here you see a layer 4 spiny stellate neuron that sends axons to layer 2, 3. Here's a layer 2, 3 pyramidal neuron that could potentially receive connections from that. It actually does. Um, and it also has axons in layer 2, 3. In fact, also there are layer 5 cells that send axons to layer 2, 3, layer 6 cells that send there. So if you're a neuron here with dendrites in layer 2, 3, and all of these cell types are found there, you, all of these cell types could potentially receive connections from any of these other cells, and you might be able to, to uh, predict the connectivity from looking at the density of axons and the number of cells of the right type that send those axons and the proportion of each of these cell types and the density of their, their dendrites. This is what uh, Binziger and, and uh, Martin and, and others have done. But um, it turns out now, if we actually look at the functional connectivity to these cells, we see something very different. Okay. And the way that we can demonstrate that is to use a method that uh, Larry Katz and I developed when I was a postdoc in his lab back in the late 80s and early 90s. And that's to simply record intracellularly from a single neuron in a brain slice. So this is a 400 micron thick slice of the cortex cut uh, in an orientation so that it preserves the vertical connections, the dominant organization of connections in the cortex. There are a lot of connections that are cut, but there are many that are preserved. And uh, then we can record intracellularly from that one neuron and fill it with dye or identify what cell type it was in other ways. And then we want to stimulate other neurons in the brain and find out where are the neurons that make functional connections to that one cell. And uh, I, I don't want to spend too much time on the details of the method, but essentially um, if you stimulate electrically, you don't have the kind of spatial resolution you need because of all the axons and dendrites that span across these layers. If you stimulate electrically, say in layer 5, you'll also stimulate cells that are in other layers. So what we use is cage glutamate. Glutamate's an excitatory neurotransmitter. Um, and this compound, which has a carboxynitrobenzyl group and an ester bond here, when you uh, shine UV light on it, will break that ester bond and release the glutamate. And since all of these neurons in the cortex are activated by glutamate, um, those neurons which see the glutamate will get to polarize and fire action potentials. So we can focus that light to a small spot and then uh, stimulate neurons locally. And with this method uh, and the way we use it, uh, only neurons that are in about, within about 50 microns of the location of the light flash will fire action potentials. That means if we record a synaptic response in this cell, it must be, there must be a cell or some cells uh, near the stimulation site that make a functional connection to that cell we're recorded from. So this allows us then to make maps of the input to single neurons. Okay? So here's a map of the input to a layer 2, 3 pyramidal neuron. And uh, I, I don't want to go too much into the details. You'll see later that there are actually many individual discrete stimulation sites. Um, and that this, we've just quantified this by summing the amplitudes of these synaptic currents together from each stimulation trial at each location. So we get a value in picoamps. <laughs> this is a, for those of you that care, a voltage clamp recording and an excitatory inward current. So this is an excitatory inward map, uh, excitatory input map for this cell. So layer two, three pyramidal cell. Virtually any cell, uh, the, any pyramidal cell you record here will look essentially the same as this one. And if you record from enough of them, you'll see they all have the same basic input map. They get strong input from layer 4 and within layer 2, 3, weaker input from layers 5 and 6. Essentially what you would have predicted if you just looked at the anatomy, if you said, you know, what are the proportions of cell types and the density of their axons projecting to layer 2, 3, you would have expected this. Okay? So that's what you see for the, the pyramidal cells. You look at... Uh, the fast spiking inhibitory cells, you see essentially the, the same basic pattern, although the strength of connections is different. So where it gets interesting is where you look at the other inhibitory cell types. And here's one type of adapting inner neuron. And this cell actually gets the majority of its input from layer 5 and much less from layer 4 and layer 2, 3, in contrast to the pattern predicted if you simply looked at the anatomy. Here's another inhibitory cell type, which receives virtually all of its input from the superficial layers and very little input from deeper layers. 
we've gone on now and, and used more methods that allow us to identify uh, green cell, GFP, jellyfish, protein expressing cells in mice of all the dozens of different cell types and we've mapped the input to all these cell types and we now know um, the, the input to each of these cell types, not just excitatory and inhibitory. But the point I want to make here is simply that connections are cell type specific. So if you want to do all those things that I said in the first slide, you want to work out the circuitry of, of the brain, you want to correlate circuitry with function, you want to perturb circuits, you need to do that at this level of resolution if you're really going to understand what's going on. So, so we need uh, better methods for cell type specificity. So this is just to, to summarize the, this point, um, that say you had a layer 5 neuron sending axons to layer 2, 3, it's much more likely uh, to connect to this cell type than to this cell type. Connections aren't uh, by chance. Okay. And in fact, this turn, turns out to be a very common feature of cortical connections. We and, and other labs have, have looked at this in many different uh, brain areas, in mouse barrel cortex, and monkey visual cortex. What I just showed you was in rat visual cortex. Um, and the, it also turns out to be true not just for inhibitory neurons, but for the many distinct types of pyramidal neurons that are found in the cortex. So, um, so uh, this isn't just uh, something that's peculiar about the cells that I chose to, to show you today. Okay. Now, it, it turns out that I, I told you that if you record from uh, layer 2, 3 pyramidal neurons and look at that input map, you'll see that they essentially all have that same basic pattern of input. But it turns out that um, layer 2, 3 pyramidal neurons that are right next to each other actually aren't both connected the same way. It turns out that um, these two different neurons can be part of different finer scale subnetworks of neurons that are embedded within the cortical column. And the data I'm going to show you next demonstrate that. Okay? So if one uh, simply, uh, sorry. uses uh, methods that have been available for 10 or 15 years and records from pairs of neurons right next to each other or in a vertical column, one of the first things you see is that there's a low probability that these two neurons will be directly connected to each other, maybe 10 or 20 percent of the time. And this falls off pretty quickly as you move uh, uh, across laterally in the cortex. And this uh, sort of sparse connectivity could mean two very different things depending on whether there are second order rules in the network. Okay? It could be that, that uh, these two cells are uh, rarely connected to each other, but the inputs that they receive could come from the same sources, and so they're carrying essentially the same kind of information, and there's some kind of reason that you might want to just have, have a larger population to, to do some kind of averaging or get rid of some source of noise. Alternatively, it could be that when these two neurons are connected to each other, they share other things in common. They get the same input, um, and they're part of a relatively independent subnetwork of neurons. Um, so so let's, let's uh, see how can we address that question. Is there some second order uh, or finer scale level of uh, connectivity in the network? Well, the way that we can do that is to again use our photostimulation method. But this time, instead of recording from a single neuron, record from two neurons. And when we photostimulate, a population of neurons fires action potentials. Um, we don't know exactly how many, probably on the order of a couple dozen cells. Um, but those action potentials come over a very long period of time and fairly stochastically, over 100 milliseconds or so. So any two neurons that you drive to fire action potentials will tend to fire action potentials at different times. Okay? So now if we record from two neurons simultaneously, and we can uh, get information about whether they share common input based on whether the synaptic responses that we detect in those cells come at the same time, like you see here, recording from the blue cell and the uh, purple cell. These were actually 
um, you know, here, here's the cell body, the purple cell, but these are just two different input maps put right next to, uh, that are separated apart. One, the input map for the blue cell, one for the purple cell, and this is just expressed as numbers of synaptic currents that were detected at each site. But you can see here that when we record from these two cells simultaneously, there, you can see this in this example for this particular stimulation site, there are some synaptic currents that come at precisely the same time here and here. So we stimulated at a time out here, neurons here fired action potentials over a protracted period of time. Here's a site where they came at different times. So we can infer that there's a high probability that the neuron that gave rise to this synaptic current in this blue cell was also connected to the purple cell. Whereas, because we also demonstrate in control experiments that I'm not showing you, that these connections are very reliable, that um, this whatever cell fired an action potential when I stimulated here, and it gave rise to this synaptic current in the blue cell, that cell probably wasn't connected to the purple cell because you didn't see a synaptic current at the same time in that cell. So we can use cross-correlation analyses to infer the amount of shared input to two neurons that are recorded uh, simultaneously. So here uh, is one example of that. Here are the uh, locations of two layer 2, 3 pyramidal cell bodies that were recorded simultaneously. Responses following photostimulation at some selected sites. Here's site uh, one is this stimulation site here, and we saw synaptic currents in both cell A and cell B, and they were very uh, uh, close together in time. Um, and if we make a cross, uh, do a cross correlation analysis of the times of synaptic events that we measure uh, in the two cells for all of the stimulation sites in layer two, three, we get this black histogram here, which has a big peak near zero, which tells us that there are a lot of correlated synaptic inputs. And we can also do a, a shifted correlogram and analyze um, what's the, the probability that by chance, because of time locking to the stimulus of action potentials that we generate in these cells, that we would, we would see, uh, you know, what will we see? That's, that's the red trace here. So if we subtract the red trace from the black uh, uh, match correlogram, we're left with the numbers of synaptic currents that can be attributed to shared input to the cells. And we can make a calculation, which we call a calculation of the correlation probability, which is an estimate of the proportion of input to these two cells that's shared. So these two cells share about 30% of their input in common from within layer 2, 3. Here for stimulation sites in layer 4, we have a correlation probability of about 22% uh, shared input and 10% uh, for layer 5. Okay. Well, it turns out that this is what you see actually in only the rare cases where the two cells are directly connected to each other. This is not what you usually see. What you usually see in a more typical pair of layer 2, 3 pyramids that is not directly connected to each other is that they don't share much common input. Here's a you know, correlation probability that's probably essentially chance levels. This is true for layer 2, 3 and layer 4. Although for layer 5, we do see that even cell pairs that are not directly connected to each other do share about 10% of their input in common. Okay? So this turns out to hold across the populations of cells that we record from. So if we plot our correlation probabilities here for stimulation sites in layer 2, 3, layer 4, and layer 5, and we group them together according to whether the layer 2, 3 pyramidal cells are directly connected to each other or not, we see that systematically the connected cell pairs share common input from layer 4 and within layer 2, 3, um, which is much at a much higher rate than the, the unconnected cell pairs. Interestingly, for in excitatory input from layer 5, it doesn't matter whether the cell pairs are directly connected or not. They share some common input, a lower probability. Um, we can also look at shared inhibitory input to the cells by changing the holding potential and looking at these outward currents. So when we photostimulate, we drive action potentials not only in excitatory cells, but also inhibitory cells. And it turns out here it doesn't matter whether the cell pairs are connected or not. They share a lot of common inhibitory input. Um, so if, uh, and you can see that here. It doesn't matter whether cell pairs are connected or not. They share common inhibitory input from layer 4 and within layer 2, 3. Obviously, you know, we don't know in these experiments what type of inhibitory neurons are providing this. So things could be, and we have evidence that they are a little bit more complicated than that, but I don't have time to tell you about that today. So if we then summarize this, what we're, we're left to say is that there are these sort of fine-scale subnetworks embedded within a cortical column, a relatively independent uh, groups of neurons. So this is, is a cartoon 
it exaggerates the situation quite a bit. Remember that I told you that the correlation probabilities for these two cells that are connected to each other is on the order of 20 to 30 percent. It's not 100 percent like I've illustrated here. And there are probably far more subgroups than, than just the two illustrated. But the basic uh, idea is illustrated here, and that's that cell pairs that are connected to each other share more, more common input from layer 4 and within layer 2, 3 than cells that are not connected to each other. Um, but input from layer 5 to layer 2, 3 follows different rules, um, and it, it seems to not pay attention to these sub-subnetworks. And uh, at least as far as the data I could show you with this experiment, there wasn't selectivity of the inhibitory input with respect to these fine-scale subnetworks. Um, so the question is whether we ever saw um, specificity of one of inhibitory connections. And yes, we did. This is, that would take me another 10 or 15 minutes, and so I deleted those slides from this talk. But there is a, there is a paper in Nature Neuroscience published also, I, I guess, in 2006, where we followed up on that. And it turns out that inhibitory connections can be specific on a fine scale, but it depends on the type of inhibitory cell. Um, and so far, we know best only for one of the types of inhibitory cells. The other inhibitory cell types where we didn't see that fine scale specificity, we weren't able to define them as well as we'd like, so we're still following up on that. So, but there is, in fact, specificity of inhibitory connections, yes, uh, on this fine scale. Okay. Okay, so, so that's the part of the talk where I say, well, well look, we've we got big trouble here, right? Because we've we got to figure out the circuitry of the brain, but it's amazingly precise. Um, and we have a relatively crude method that I just showed you that allows us at some level to, for a limited subset of the connections in the brain to show you what that precision is. Um, but um, we don't have a way of correlating those cell types with function. You know, we stick an electrode in the brain and we just record uh, from whatever cell our, you know, especially in an awake monkey, whatever cell our uh, metal electrode happens by chance to come close to, and we really don't know which cell type we're recorded from. Um, so we can't, you know, how, how are we going to correlate circuitry to function at that level of resolution? And we need to uh, perturb circuitry, and we've had for a long time methods like make a lesion at some part of the brain or, um, or maybe put uh, GABA in locally to uh, uh, inactivate a small module. But if we really want to understand uh, how these, this sort of cell type specificity or even the fine scale specificity relates to function and to be able to test hypotheses at this level, we need tools that are going to allow us to, say, selectively inactivate a particular cell type without affecting the other cells of the same type. We might like to have a method of you know, recording the activity not just of one layer 2, 3 pyramidal neuron, but knowing the activity of the population of neurons that directly impinges on that one layer 2, 3 pyramidal neuron. So I'm going to tell you are there, ways, there are ways now that we have hope that we are going to be able to do this. Um, and um, so essentially we have to bridge this gap between what we can do in these sort of reduced systems like this slice we can put in a dish and, uh, and uh, larger scale systems like a, a whole monkey or a human brain. And, and the way that we can do this is exactly the thing that I tried really hard to avoid uh, when I was a graduate student. I hated any, anyone have anything to do with molecular biology. And I, I uh, you know, sort of thought, you know, NIH is, is wasting all their time giving all these guys doing molecular biology all this money to figure out how genes are regulated and all this kind of stuff. And we should really be looking at the anatomy of the brain. Well, it, well it, it turns out that, that we are going to be able to benefit from all that information we got about molecular biology. And that's because the, the basic thing that makes two cells different from each other in the first place is they express different genes. Okay? So if we understand what the, the, the molecular and genetic mechanisms are that are responsible for making those cells different, we can harness those differences to, um, to selectively manipulate a particular cell type. So. Um, now, now that's, that's something that's very difficult to do, but it has been done, and you'll see at least one example that I'll show you of, of that. Um, but 
and this is something that has been most successful so far in experiments in mice. But there are also uh, ways we can do this even in monkeys, and that's to take advantage of viral vectors that have been developed for human gene therapy. So we can make a viral vector that will introduce DNA sort of indiscriminately into neurons in the brain. And then this, this second thing here is how we get a specific cell type targeted, at least one way to do it, which is, turns out to be a very difficult way, but it sometimes works, and that's to take the part of the genetic machinery that's responsible for regulating gene expression and to put that upstream of some other gene that you want to introduce, what you call a transgene. And I'll give you examples of transgenes that we would like to express in the brains of animals to allow us to perturb specific cell types to inactivate them, or transgenes that allow us to work out the circuitry, find out the connections of a specific cell type. There are other ways to target specific cell types. One of them is to use viruses that will only infect specific cell types, and we're engineering viruses to do that. Um, another is uh, use a virus that will infect through axon terminals. Since different neurons project to different places, you can put it in a place where a particular cell type projects and then have cells far away that we're projecting there that are selectively infected and not the other cell types that don't project there. At any rate, that's all about you know, how do you get genes into specific cells, and we can do that, and, and this technology has been around for, uh, for 10 or 20 years, but is uh, uh, constantly improving. Um, but to do that, to, to be able to take advantage of this, you have to have a gene to express that allows you to do something, something useful, to work out circuitry, to perturb circuits, to uh, correlate circuitry with activity. I'm going to tell you about two examples of that, a method we've developed to allow selective and quickly reversible inactivation of a specific cell type. And uh, then I'll tell you about a method that allows us to identify the connectivity of specific cell types or even of a single neuron. And, and in fact, you know, it's, it's, it's not a mystery that, that this kind of a method would, would be very useful. In fact, uh, Francis Crick, who uh, influenced a lot of uh, the directions that my lab took at the Salk Institute, you know, said uh, and emphasized for quite a while that molecular biology would, in fact, provide the tools for characterizing the structure and function of the nervous system. And, and even 20 years before that, he specifically stated what kind of methods we'd want. One of them was to have a method by which all the neurons of just one type could be inactivated, leaving the others more or less unaltered. So I'm going to show you that method. Um, and I'm also going to then show you a method for labeling all of the inputs to a single neuron. So here's the, the basic thing you want to do. We have some module in the brain which is composed of many cell types, and we'd like to be able to selectively inactivate, switch on and off one cell type within that structure. And here's, you know, this is just telling you what I told you already, how you might target them. Say you use a viral vector that indiscriminately uh, infects all cell types, but you use a cell type specific promoter which drives the expression of that genetic molecular switch only in this specific cell type. So, but what do you use for a molecular switch? So what we wanted to do was to find some gene that we could express, a protein that would be made, that um, would uh, be in the cells and would essentially sit there and do nothing at first. We, wouldn't, don't, we don't want it to do anything until we want to flip the switch off. And then we want to be able to add something to the brain that will flip the switch and turn the neurons off. So I uh, searched the literature trying to find something that, that would work for this. And, and one of the things I searched for was a receptor which might couple through G proteins to cause potassium channels to open. Because this is one of the mechanisms by which inhibition works in the brain already, is that GABA B receptors uh, activate G proteins and cause potassium channels to open. If you open potassium channels, as you'll see, this shunts uh, this uh, clamp cells at the potassium reversal potential. And I'll, I'll show you that this, this works. Um, so what I searched for was a G-protein coupled receptor that would couple to the right class of G-proteins to activate these receptors. But I wanted a receptor that perhaps would not be, in, would not be activated by anything that's endogenous to the mammalian brain, um, but that could be activated by something. In this case, it's going to be elatostatin, and this is the elatostatin receptor from Drosophila. Um, and you would want that ligand to be selective for that uh, receptor. You would hope that there's not any other receptor endogenous to the brain, to a mammalian brain, that would be able to be activated by that. So it turns out that this elatostatin receptor meets those criteria. So here's one of the first experiments we did several years ago, just testing whether this might possibly work. And we expressed this uh, G-protein coupled receptor from Drosophila um, in uh, cortical neurons and recorded intracellularly from them, 
And here's one of these intracellular recordings. The resting membrane potential of the cell is about minus 60 millivolts. If we inject a little bit of current in the cell, it depolarizes and fires an action potential, and we can figure out how much current that takes. Now, when we put a lot of statin uh, into the bath, this is an in vitro recording, um, this causes potassium channels to open, so the cell hyperpolarizes toward the potassium reversal potential. And we also see an even more dramatic effect, and that's this change in input resistance. As we inject negative current into the cell body and look at the voltage deflection, we can see that initially we see a big deflection. Um, but as the input resistance uh, decreases because of all these channels opening up, now we're not able to get as big of a voltage deflection with the same amount of current injected. So the input resistance is decreasing, and the cell's hyperpolarized. So the combination of these makes it so that now it takes a lot more current to get an action potential generated in this cell. Okay? So, um, so this is potentially something that would inactivate the cell. We can leave this pe peptide on for hours and maintain this effect, or we can wash it off. Uh, as quickly as we can wash it off, we get recovery. Um, and importantly, control neurons that are not expressing the allatostatin receptor are not affected by allatostatin. Okay. So we made a virus to express this receptor uh, in, uh, in brain. And uh, also, green fluorescent protein will be expressed at lower levels in the same cell so we can identify the locations where we put our virus and make sure we record it from those. So this is uh, one of the experiments in vivo test testing this. This is a fairly crude recording, just uh, local field potential. We record in the barrel cortex, which is connected to the whisker pad through some synaptic pathways of a rat. Um, we electrically stimulate the whisker pad. Here's a big stimulus artifact. And we see this big voltage deflection, which is the ensemble of a whole lot of neurons that are firing action potentials. When we put on a lot of statin, just a few drops onto the surface of the cortex, that local field potential, that response disappears, and we can wash it out and recover it. And here's uh, the, the effect of a different drug, which we know to be able to block activity, and we see a similar response. This shows you that there's complete inactivation. doesn't show you the time course. So here's the time course. This is that same experiment, and these time points here some, from some of those recordings. So this is a time course of some minutes here, and uh, this local field potential size is, is you know, wavers a bit. It's not a real, uh, you know, stable recording. But when we put a lot of statin onto the surface of the brain, we get that inactivation that you saw, and we can wash it off and repeat this over and over again, uh, inactivation and recovery. And there's another example here. This is a control experiment where we just express green fluorescent protein recorded here, and you see the lot of statin has no effect, even at much higher doses. And now we've gone to even, you know, thousandfold higher doses than that, and we see this is a very selective. Um, agonist. So, uh, so we have this method. We can inactivate large populations of cells. Here's response of a single neuron uh, in the visual system of a ferret in the visual thalamus. Uh, it's responding to an optimized visual stimulus. This is a firing rate to the best visual stimulus, 99% contrast rating, a lower contrast rating, spontaneous activity. And we have some control injections of saline. Uh, an initial injection, uh, which has a small effect here and a bigger uh, effect the second time, the neuron's completely inactivated, no longer any visual response to even the best stimulus we can generate, and then it gradually recovers as the allatostatin washes, washes out. In this case, we weren't, because it's a deeper brain structure, we couldn't wash it out. We just had to wait for it to, to diffuse away, and this can recover and repeat. Okay, And again, a control showing that this works. Now, so, so what I showed you there so far is um, just uh, proof that this method works. If you express a lattice receptor in a neuron, you put a lattice on it, you can completely inactivate it. Uh, um, but that doesn't address an interesting question, right? So where it gets interesting is where you selectively express the receptor in a particular cell type and ask uh, how that affects activity in a network. So Martin Goulding, who's also at the Salk Institute, made a line of transgenic mice which um, will express the allatostatin receptor only in a subset of cells. And I don't want to get into the genetic tricks here, but uh, there's uh, some uh, a, a way to use expression of something called Cre recombinase in a specific cell type, and that will cut out a stop site which allows the allatostatin receptor to, to be expressed only in those cells that express the Cre recombinase. And that's what's shown here is a subset of neurons in the spinal cord that are expressing the green fluorescent protein, which tells us that they're also expressing the allatostatin receptor. Okay? And it turns out that 
Martin was particularly interested in these inhibitory neurons because he'd worked out their circuitry and, and other things about them and thought that they might be involved in regulating oscillatory activity in the spinal cord as a central pattern generator. And there's alternating activity between left and right sides of the spinal cord and also between extensor and flexor muscles. And he can record from the outputs of the spinal cord, the ventral roots, and here's recording from, an, from a, uh, a ventral root that's related to extensors versus flexors, and you see that there's this rhythmic alternating activity between the extensor and flexor muscles uh, back and forth, and it, it's a, a time scale that alternates every few seconds. Okay? And he thought from the circuitry of these cells that they might be involved in regulating the offset, turning off the, uh, the step. Okay? And uh, in fact, when he inactivated these cells then, he found that the step cycle increased. So the periodicity here changed from a few seconds to uh, closer to 10 seconds. So he's able to, to implicate this cell type in, and has models about how, how this works in, in the circuit. And you can wash it out, showing that this isn't some artifact of you know, the, the circuit compensating for, say, if you had killed that cell type. Okay? So, so that, that works. And that, that's the bottom line here is we have this method available, and, and now we can use it to perturb cir circuits with cell type uh, selectivity. Okay. Now, this, the second method that I want to tell you about is uh, at a little bit earlier stage. Um, so I'm going to tell you, uh, show you experiments in culture that show proof of principle um, that the method uh, works. Okay? And this is a method which allows us to um, label all of the neurons that are directly connected to a single neuron. And, uh, but I'll tell you at the end how we can extend that to also ask about <coughs> circuitry of particular uh, cell types and, and uh, even single neurons in vivo. So all the, the, what I'm going to show you right now is data from in vitro, but it is uh, cortical circuitry. And there, there are a lot of people around that have, have been talking about doing things like 3D EM reconstruction of, of the cortex and things like that, which um, still the technology doesn't exist to get it there. And even if it does for a little cube of cortex, um, you know, you're going to miss all the connections that are from farther away, which are actually a pretty a substantial proportion of the connection. So what we'd really like to do is say, you know, take some layer two, say a layer two, three neuron in mouse uh, cortex and label each of those 5,000 neurons that provide direct input to that cell, not only um, locally, like I showed you with the photostimulation, but in the thalamus, in the structures that provide modulatory input in the cortical cortical connections, to also do that for each of the cell types in the brain and really have a map of the circuitry at this at single cell resolution. Okay. So here's what it looks like when it works. This is a uh, slice culture from rat cortex, and the white matter is down here and the pia up here. And you can't quite see it here, but there's a tiny little one of these neurons here, which is yellow. And that's because it's expressing both a red fluorescent protein and a green fluorescent protein. And all of these green neurons are green because they're connected to that one neuron. Okay. Well, how do, we, how do we make this happen? How, do we, how are we able to label all the cells that provide only direct input to that one cell. Um, well, the way that we do this is to use rabies virus that's been modified in a couple ways. We need to modify, so, so rabies virus naturally will infect neurons if you just put it in the brain, but it'll indiscriminately infect all cell types. Okay? So first you need a way to make it target only that one cell and not all of them. And also, once it infects some cells, what it does as part of its natural life cycle is to replicate and then spread only in one direction retrogradely from the postsynaptic neuron to the presynaptic neurons. And then it uh, will infect those cells, and, and, and you would detect it in the input cells as well. But it would continue to replicate and continue to spread across multiple synapses. So you've got a couple of problems with normal rabies virus. It, it um, indiscriminately infects all cell types. And it continues to spread. So we've got to uh, uh, make two modifications to the rabies virus to make this work. One is to find a way to make it uh, initially infect only a particular cell or cell type. And the second is to make it so it will go only one synapse and stop. And the way that we solve those problems are both related. Okay? So um, first, I'll, I'll talk about how do we make it go one synapse and stop. So let's just assume that we can solve this problem of making the virus infect only this one cell. Um, and the method that we're going to use is called transcomplementation. What we're going to do is we're going to delete a gene from the genome of the virus, which is required to allow the virus to spread. And then we're going to um, 
introduce that gene into the cell in trans through a separate piece of DNA that can't be incorporated into this virus. So if we get those in there, and we'll worry later about how we do that. Um, now, th we've also put into the viral genome green fluorescent protein, so the cell will turn green. Um, and now, because this cell um, has the missing gene expressed in it, this cell can make viral particles that are able to spread to the directly connected cells. But, but remember, there's a missing gene from the viral genome that's required for viral spread. So these secondarily infected cells, which haven't been given DNA to, that codes for that missing gene, can't make viral particles that will be able to get out of the cell. So it's stuck in them. So it goes only one synapse and then stops. Okay. Okay. Now, how do we, we, we make the virus go only one? Uh, and how do we make the virus initially infect only this one cell when we inject it into the brain and not infect the, the other cells? Well, it turns out that the solution to this is related to the transcomplementation. What we what we did is to delete from the genome a particular gene uh, called the glycoprotein gene. So here's a schematic of a rabies viral particle. It has RNA in here, the, the genome of the virus. And there's also some other proteins that were coded by that RNA that are part of it. But it has a host cell-derived membrane envelope. And embedded in that envelope is the glycoprotein. So this glycoprotein is absolutely required for virus to be able to get out of the cell and infect another cell. And what we've done is to delete from the genome of this rabies virus the glycoprotein gene. Okay? So this is that missing gene that I talked about, the thing that you've got to transcomplement. But what this means, though, is that if we want to get a particle that looks like this and has glycoprotein on its surface, we have to grow it in cells and culture with um, the, uh, those cells expressing the glycoprotein so that it can get onto these viral particles as they bud out of those cells. Well, if we can do that, well, we can put a different glycoprotein on it. We don't have to, we're not stuck with rabies glycoprotein. We can, put a, we can pseudotype this virus and put on it the glycoprotein from some other virus, which has different infectious properties. And what we did is to use uh, the glycoprotein from an avian virus, which isn't able to infect mammalian cells. So if we put a virus like this into a mammalian brain, it can't infect anything. But we know what the receptor is for that virus. Um, and that receptor is called TVA. So we've we've pseudotyped this virus with an envelope protein from birds called ENVE. This is avian sarcoma leucosis virus type A. And it happens that our collaborators at the Salk Institute were, were the people who discovered uh, this envelope protein and the receptor for it, TVA. Okay? So if we get this one cell to express TVA, so that's what's illustrated with these little hairy things on the surface, receptor for this virus, now when we put this pseudotype virus in the brain, it will only infect this one cell. We also introduced that missing gene in this one cell, and now everything should work. Okay, well, does it work? Um, okay, so here's first a control experiment. What we're going to do is to use a method where we coat gold particles with DNA, and we're going to coat them with uh, two uh, plasmids to code for two genes, the TVA, that's the receptor for the NVA, for the virus, and DSRED, just so we know which cells got transfected. And we shoot these gold particles into one of those slice cultures, and randomly a, a couple of them will land in the right place in the cell so it can express. So here's a cell uh, several days later that is uh, red because that uh, gold particle went into the cell and got expression. So this cell is presumably also expressing TVA. Well, now let's put the virus on and see if it does selectively infect this cell and whether the virus is unable to spread out of that cell. And sure enough, when we do this, and we count for lots and lots of cells, we see that this NVA pseudotype virus is only able to infect cells that express TVA. And when it does, it doesn't spread out of them because we haven't complemented. We haven't done the transcomplementation. Okay. Now when we put it all together, we, in addition to the TVA and DSRED, we add the rabies glycoprotein gene. So I should have three plasmids here. And now we put the virus on, and now you see that the virus is able to spread from that red cell to the cells that are presumably directly connected to that cell. So here's, that's, that's how it works, and it does work. Now, um, here are some pictures of, uh, of, you know, I showed you that one sort of beautiful example of one cell and everything connected to it. But unfortunately, the um, transfection method that I showed you, biolistics, um, gives things that more often look like this. You notice there are several red cells. So we shoot those gold particles in, and we get several cells. And so we might see things like this, where there's one cluster that's maybe connected to that cell and one cluster connected to that cell. But what we really want to do is prove that this method really works, right? Do, are all these green cells really connected to that red cell? 
And the way to do that ideally would be to have a way to transfect only one cell. And we're now able to do that. We finally got good at it. We electroprate DNA into single cells with a pipette. But at the time of these experiments, we weren't that good at it yet. And so we used the biolistics. Um, and that imposes a limitation on our ability to test the, the reliability here, and that's that we always have a couple of cells or a few cells, and we can select out some cases that are better than others. But say we, we're going to test, um, is that green cell connected to that one? And if it turns out it's not, well, maybe it's because it was connected to that cell. So that's just sort of warning you that the data I'm about to show you isn't perfect. Um, nevertheless, it's pretty good and consistent with the, the likelihood that we know from all other studies with rabies virus that rabies only spreads to cells that are, really are connected to each other. Okay? So what we did is to go in and record from red cells and record from green cells, drive action potentials in the green cells, and see if they're connected. So here's uh, one of these examples. This uh, happens to be a case where the green cell is an inhibitory cell and drives these outward currents in the red cell, so we can demonstrate it's connected. And here's a case of an excitatory connection. And in 11 recordings made like this, nine were found to be connected and two not. Hopefully that's because there was some other red cell nearby that was responsible for turning that cell green. Um, and in cases where we recorded from non-green cells just as close to the red cell, we found no connections, zero out of 10, 10 cases. So, so far, this looks quite good, but we need to follow up and have a real precise estimate of how accurate this method is. And we also need to do experiments, which we've, uh, we know how to do them, and we will do them, to also identify the rate of false negatives. Do you truly label each of the thousands of cells that provides input to the one cell? Okay. And so with this method, we can use it like I showed you. If we label inputs to single neurons in vivo, we can electroporate DNA into a single cell. But there are also genetic methods, like I told you, to restrict gene expression to a particular cell type. So if we express TVA and rabies glycoprotein in a particular cell type, we can work out the circuitry in a cell type specific way. Um, and uh, there, there are other ways to, to approach this. But ultimately, I think that we can, because it's a genetic method and a way of targeting expression to a sub-circuit in the brain, that we can also combine it with other things like genetically expressed sensors of activity or things that allow us to perturb activity like channel rhodops and halo rhodops and things like that that I didn't talk about that other labs have developed so that we can um, do things like record from a single neuron, measure its visual response, and directly correlate the activity of that one cell with the activity of the population of cells that provides input to it, or to perturb selectively in patterned, uh, dynamic ways the cells that provide input to a single cell. So there is hope that we are going to have uh, the ability to uh, do all of these things that we need to do at the level of resolution of single cells and specific uh, cell types. And so I'll end by uh, acknowledging the people who did all of this work. Jamie Dansker did the work I talked about at the start, showing differences in input to different inhibitory cell types. Uh, Yumi Yoshimura did the, all the work with the photostimulation and cross-correlation analysis. There are a number of people who worked on the genetic inactivation method, Hilde Lechner at the start with the in vitro stuff, and then uh, Greg Horwitz and uh, Yoshi Yamaguchi, Elaine Tan, and probably some other people here I'm not quite catching worked on the inactivation in vivo. And then the uh, rabies virus work was done predominantly by, by Ian Wickersham. He was the main person on that, a graduate student in the lab. And he also had some help from David Lyon with the slice cultures and Tech Mori for the uh, paired recordings. And then John Young's lab uh, helped us with the pseudotyping, John Young and his postdoc, Richard Barnard. Thanks. Thank you. Time for about three questions. I'd like to start by asking one. Uh, with respect to the, the issue of the, the, the different uh, s groupings of cells uh, that appear to be uh, 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 interacting with the, among themselves, but not so much between them, uh, you, you mentioned that there are inhibitory uh, neurons that, that uh, sort of do the opposite. And uh, could do those perhaps uh, have uh, gap junctions? Yeah, so, um, so it turns out that um, some of them do the opposite and some of them do the same thing, and it, it varies depending on the type of cell. And yes, each type of inhibitory cell 
uh, couple selectively to only the other cells of the same type through gap junctions, this is probably important in generating rhythmic oscillatory activity. So for example, the fast spiking inhibitory cells turn out to be the ones that are selective within those fine scale subnetworks, and they tend to create oscillations in the gamma range. Um, and so these are all things that you know, one can test if you have ways to, say, selectively turn on or off a particular inhibitory cell type or to express a dominant negative gap junction only in one inhibitory cell type and not the others to affect the ability to oscillate at a particular frequency. Thank you. Next question. Yes. Of, of neurons that, that jointly receive uh, common input uh, being different if they were connected in the case of pyramids, not in the case of interneurons, it, it suggests a, a pretty natural causal relationship. If pyramids have joint input, they, they're both firing and, and they would tend to connect to each other, whereas with interneurons, the opposite happens. If they're both firing, they might inhibit each other. And it raises the question of whether you've done a pyramid interneuron dual recording, which you would predict if the pyramid's connected to the interneuron, then they would uh, be receiving joint input. Yeah. Is that the case? Yeah. So, so the follow-up paper to that, which is published, shows that if you record from a pyramid and an inhibitory neuron, um, that if it's a fast-spiking interneuron and they're connected, they share common input. In fact, the fast-spiking neuron only connects the inhibitory neuron, mm -hmm. to, only connects the excitatory neuron if it's reciprocally connected. So there's specificity even at, at that level. But for the other inhibitory cell types, there is not that specificity. But we don't know what cell types those were, so we need to do more, more work on that to really work out that circuitry in more detail. But I think you're exactly right. That, you know, I, if I had to guess about how these circuits develop, and Yumi is following up in her lab in Japan, looking at development of this fine scale specificity, she's seen at the earlier ages at least for the excitatory cells, the initial connections that are formed are not specific in this way. So probably it's an activity-dependent, Hebbian sort of rule. But we all know that, that those rules can be more complex. They're spike t really, we should say, spike timing-dependent plasticity rather than just Hebbian. And the, the rules can easily be different for different cell types, and probably are. And especially within the context of a dynamic network of neurons that's firing and creates oscillations. And so the t relative timing between different cell types can be different. So that's likely to be how those circuits are set up. I, I the, the excitement of living at a time when, when these kinds of questions can actually be addressed experimentally is, is just amazing to me personally. One last question, Soren. Um, my, my question is, is related to thinking, thinking if you're thinking towards the future uh, in terms of, or your thoughts really, and that is toward a way of potentially getting at the synaptic strengths once you have the connections, let's say yeah. all the connections to one neuron, all the computer scientists, you know, just probably figure they, they're missing one, uh, one element and that's, the, that's right. the number to put in the matrix. Yeah, right? yeah, so, so the, the anatomy is one piece, but you, you also need the circuitry. So, so I think we'll be able to do that and the, what we plan to do and we're already doing is, uh, as I mentioned, that the rabies virus is, you know, we can manipulate its genome. Um, so what we're doing is putting channel rhodopsin into the rabies virus. So we end up with a population of neurons that are green and, and selectively activatable by light. You know, no more cage glutamate. You know, the channel rhodopsin is a light-gated ion channel. And mm -hmm. so then we should be able to record. In a, so first, we'll label in vivo, make a brain slice, record from that cell, because that's a lot easier for us to do, right? So, so it'll at least tell us about the local connections. Some caveats about, you know, there are going to be some connections that were cut. But hopefully, other people will develop the ability to make channel rhodopsin work with two-photon excitation. That's so far not working for people. But we should also be able to do that in vivo. So I really hope that you know, we'll label in vivo one cell, all the cells connected to it. We've, we're finally getting the two-photon imaging in my lab set up so we can then you know, go in, record a few days later after they're all labeled from that one cell, and then flashlight. I, I hope not only will we be able to say, you know, what's the uh, 
strength of each of those connections, but then to be able to stimulate in dynamic patterns, selecting from that subpopulation that we really do know impinges on that, and to ask about how inputs are temporally integrated. So far, you know, when we talk about dendritic integration, all of the data we have is from sort of fake synaptic inputs. You know, you encage glutamate at different places, but we don't know if inputs from different sources might be organized on the dendritic arbor in a particular way that makes the dendritic arbor, the, the dendritic integration follow different rules that are not linear, that might be superlinear or sublinear, and the rules might depend on where the input is coming from, and also questions about how inhibition interacts with excitation, the way it's integrated in the dendritic arbor. So those are really, you know, on our list of things we want to do, but it's going to be hard, and it's going to take us a few years, I think, to really be able to generate that kind of data. Let's thank Professor Calloway again.